Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention to my weekly email newsletter, Friday Focus. Each Friday, I focus on one topic with one action arising. The link to sign up is in the show notes or head over to amyrolinson.com and sign up right now. Hello and welcome, Kalindi Jordan, to Focus on Way. How are you, Kalindi? I'm feeling really good today, thank you. And is that not the norm? It is quite the norm, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling, um, although a little bit tired, I'm not so great with the uh, winter months, but um, surrender, as long as I surrender to the uh, lowering of the light, um, I tend to be good, but I'm feeling good today. Yeah, it is. It you. is interesting, isn't it, how your energy is affected by the the light and the warmth that we have or don't have. Absolutely, I I am a bit of a sun worshipper, so as much as possible, getting my skin out and in the sunshine. Um, so yeah, I miss the sunshine for sure. And where are you based at the moment? Where's home for you? So I live in Somerset. I live quite close to Glastonbury. I actually live in a little village called Pilton, which is where the big Glastonbury Festival is held, which many people may have heard of in Somerset. It's very beautiful countryside around here, very peaceful. Fabulous. And you had a, a big event this year in 2021. Well, actually, and it's now 2022 when this episode comes out. So last year, I should say. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um do you mean Glastonbury Festival before? Yeah, that was a big one. And um, yeah, I've actually been there um, nearly every year of my life because I grew up around here, went away and came back. But um, yeah, it's been part of my childhood, the festival, um, which was actually in lots of ways when I think back, um, being growing up in a, a small village, um, you're sort of limited about the, the outside world sees so far away and you're sort of playing in the fields and the trees. But then every year having a huge amount of fascinating people arrive in your village for at least a week or two. Um, and the amount of interesting people I talked to and watched and witnessed and all the music and all the circus, I feel was actually a really positive influence in making my life quite diverse and quite expanded because of the view of the world sort of almost coming coming to me in this small village or coming to to us here so yeah that's a great perspective especially as a young impressionable child to because you you do have this bubble this small bubble of living in a village i mean i i remember being in a similar environment but my world was, my little village was just out Stratford, outside Stratford-upon-Avon. So again, you know, the whole world comes to Stratford-upon-Avon to see the theatre. And I got a bigger glimpse of the world, even though I was in a hamlet of a village myself. So really interesting, really interesting perspective. I'm sure we'll pick up on that a little bit further. I just want to say a, a shout out, a thank you to Helen Chorley for introducing us. Helen has brought many wonderful people onto Focus on Why. I'm still waiting for her to come, but her time will come. And I just wanted to say thank you to Helen before we kick off here. So what is it, Kalindi, that you're up to at the moment? So in, in my life, actually, at the moment, I'm really, I am really following my passion, which is I have a real passion around people having really wholesome, deep, expanded, sensual and sexual experience. And really conscious, committed, emotionally mature relationship and using relationship as a medium to actually self-inquire, self-evolve, um, 
to deepen our relationship with ourselves, but also our relationship with the planet. And so a lot of what I'm doing, not just in my work life, but in my relationships with my family, friends and people around me is that what I'm craving and what I yearn for and what I hopefully create is a sense of what does it mean to be consciously connected? What does it mean to be um, in our pleasure, whether that be just our sexual pleasure, but also more than that, what does it feel to be connected to something deeper, maybe more profound, something that stays consistent underneath the ever-changing tapestry of life, the ever-changing thoughts in our heads, the ever-changing emotions? What is it that's consistently here with us that we can rest in and resource ourselves in? And so I have a real passion for relational connection, for it to be positive, nourishing, unfolding. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a big part of what I'm <laughs> exploring personally and in the work that I do around sexual healing and uh, conscious relationships and sexuality. And how did this become your path? I was obviously thinking about coming on, speaking on here with you. And one of the things that was coming up and I've often reflected on is I remember, um, I remember being as a child, I was very much, was, I was very quiet, I was very shy, but I was very much a child that was listening, I was watching people. And I always felt the incongruence around the adults around me between what they were actually saying and what I felt from them. And so there was always this fascination around what's really going on underneath. Not that I would have labeled that as a child, but as I look back, I never really understood people because they never quite said what they meant <laughs> or what they were at least feeling. Or, And I never really got the way that people would pick on each other or tease each other or not be very nice to each other. Because I actually remember feeling everybody was quite amazing. I was quite fascinated by everybody. Um, and then as I came into my teenage years, I remember the same thing, watching, watching how people interacted. And I remember feeling quite sad, actually, because there's almost like a fear in people to be vulnerable or there was a fear of not really revealing themselves. And I used to ask people a lot of questions around what they were thinking, what they were feeling and, how, and what did it feel when they fancied some, somebody else in the class and what does that feel like? And I guess I started off with that sense of, almost like wanting to understand the game of life, wanting to understand how people relate, and also myself, obviously, how people relate. Um, and also I remember feeling, as I came into my own sexual exploration, I actually felt incredibly free, and I felt incredibly curious. Um, and even though I was quite quiet, I was actually quite uh, playful and inquisitive and you know, luckily didn't get myself into too much trouble, but um, had a lot of fun in the exploration of myself. And in that, I also found it hard watching people judge themselves and not feel beautiful or um, not feel worthy somehow. And I actually became somebody that everybody used to tell their secrets to. <laughs> so I guess this is how I've then become into that therapeutic realm of listening to, listening to people's uh, secrets, listening to people's depth, listening to their vulnerability with no judgment, because I'm actually purely fascinated. So it definitely started in teenage years and I um, 
yeah and that's that then took me into a journey later for sure which I can share it's fascinating you, you talked about relational connection and yet you you saw a disconnect yeah and you saw it early and you were you're talking about there was this incongruence between what people were saying and what they were feeling or what they were doing and and this is an incredible emotional intelligence that you naturally had as a, a young child going into teenage years this was it learnt or did you just feel I mean did you I'm just trying to understand is how did you become who you are now from there what was the journey along that point I guess there was um I guess it was because I was very quiet and I I, I think I, I feel even though I am actually quite extroverted I actually quite introverted and so it was the observational quality that I had so I think I I definitely taught myself so I do feel the value in stepping back and listening and watching but not with so much with the mind more with the body I remember um in my teenage years being uh, incredibly physical in a lot of the sports teams and um, and there was a natural instinct to listen with my body. So I do think there was something just quite natural in my system where, uh, and I guess I could call it an empathy now, like a somatic empathy, not that I labelled it back then. Um, but it was almost like a feeling in my body when something was disconnected or not not quite in resonance with what somebody might be expressing and of course it wasn't maybe as fine-tuned as it is now as I've grown older but I definitely remember it being there um but as I as I I as I was about 18 I actually ended up in a meditation community and this is where I started to really delve into the inner landscape and really meet the sort of psychological, the emotional and the physical curiosity of the, to the answer of who am I? I started to fall into the who am I questions of life. <laughs> um, so in some ways that was quite early because I fell into that when I was about 17, 18, always having this fascination of who am I and who is everybody? What, what is this depth that I feel? What is, surely I'm more than this. And I remember being, a, as a child, I used to cover up my ears, cover up my eyes, hold my nose and my mouth and go fall into the blackness and go, I wonder what it feels like to die and where do we go? What's going to happen? And so if I die, what is it that dies and who's here thinking? <laughs> who's here feeling in this body? What is this? Uh, I remember just lying there in my bed trying to work it out by experimenting with holding my breath and closing my eyes and seeing where I'd end up. And obviously I'd breathe again and still be here <laughs> so you talk about the meditation and you're you're sharing this natural instinct that you have I mean it sounds very much that there was a wise soul within and you, you've talked a lot about this deeper more profound commitment and this going inner and into yourself more deeply explain what that has given for you and what that now gives to others when you help them to find that connection I guess on, from the initial stages I feel like what it's given me for through my younger years was definitely a way to survive in a world of very confusing information <laughs> so I can definitely see the the nature of it becoming a survival technique to listen to watch to understand people more deeply. So on that sort of vulnerable level, uh, a sense of uh, safety in the world. Um, 
and then growing from that. Um, I feel it's very rare that I ever feel alone. It's there's a sense of there's something deeper and whatever people might label that to be, and I don't particularly need to label it myself, but there's a sense of having investigated and fallen into the depths to find something that's consistent. And so I feel what it's given to me is whenever the world gets a bit much on the outside, either because of what's happening around or what's happening in my thoughts or what's happening in my inner world, I can just rest back into something that's consistently committed. And it's beyond the fluctuations of who and what I've got myself caught in, as it were, in the, in the world. And so therefore, it w with people that I work with and, and share, there's a inquiry into what the triggers are in people and what's inhibiting their relationship to something deeper and what's their relationship to pleasure, what's got in the way. And so it's like becoming a detective, a detective of energy almost. Um, and I love it. It's like people are so fascinating, like the layers of why the body protects itself, why the psyche protects itself and why the heart, the emotions and what it does to uh look after itself and survive this world. But ultimately, I think people are, re are, are also looking for consistent connection and a sense of who am I in the world? What's my, what is it all about? And how do I find happiness? Although, you know, in my world, I feel that happiness is not necessarily the ultimate <laughs> achievement. <laughs> it's part, it's nice to be happy. Um, so I feel like what it brings is a sense of a pathway weaving through people's uh, inner landscape to, to help remove, change, transform, what's got in the way of them really feeling beautiful, really feeling a sense of connection to something bigger than themselves, but also something that's consistent inside themselves, that consistently loves, consistently is there for them. Yeah, it's very beautiful, as I say it, and sort of feels nice to say. And you talk about this sense and this sense has been different in what you've talked about so far. You've talked about the sense of what does it mean to be consciously connected. You've talked about the sense of understanding the game of life and you've talked about the sense of safety in the world and the, the, the sense of who am I. And just, ne just then you talked about the sense of a pathway which is weaving its way through this landscape or inner landscape and the sense of connection. What is the sensing for you? What is the sensing? Do you mean as an experience? Yeah, because you, you use it as a phrase, but I've got a feeling that it's more than just an expression. Mm. I'll describe it as a feeling. <laughs> I'll describe it if I can. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. So. <laughs> um, it's almost like when I close my eyes, I can hear the thoughts moving. I can feel the thoughts moving. When I breathe and feel in my body, I can feel the emotions moving. And it's like if, if we keep falling, it's almost like as if you free flow. It's almost like letting go as if you're flying. There's a sense that of keeping falling underneath all the thoughts, not getting, not, it's almost like not holding on to them, not holding on to any sensation in the body, noticing all of it, feeling all of it. 
and letting myself fly is very much like feeling a flying. And in that, there's a space inside that just suddenly goes, I've got you. It's almost like being held. But even those words don't quite encapsulate it. It's a sense that there's something. It's almost like, I don't know if you get this, like. There's almost like a background sound that we always hear all the time, but we're so busy talking, moving, doing things. But actually, when we stop, we can just hear this background hum. It's like having that inside that's consistent and supportive. And that that sort of layer of protection or that sense of safety that you spoke about and that consistency, why is safety and consistency so paramount for you? I guess for me in the witnessing of uh, human nature, there's... Well, I've experienced it and I'm sure many people experience this. The, life is so unpredictable. Anything can happen. We, have, we sort of have a structure in our mind that says, oh, after this, I'm going to go have a cup of tea. I'm going to eat my dinner. I'm going to go to bed. I wake up tomorrow, go to work. We have it. It's like a program that keeps us mentally safe. But the reality is, is life is incredibly unpredictable. Because, of course, I might leave here and someone might ring me, so I won't get my cup of tea. So it's like there's a sense of um, the safety comes from the surrender to being comfortable with the flexibility of life. To be able to know where is the consistency, where is the part of us all that stays in the moment, while the moment fluctuates and changes and moves. And and then I feel that what that does is it invites our nervous system to also be malleable and flow and change and move with the tides around us and move with the changes of now this person's coming and this person's calling me and now this is happening or my car's broken down, I'm not going to get to where I'm going to. So it's and then if we, if we equate that then to, for example, because I have a real passion around sexuality and pleasure and sensuality, my experience of working with that, these themes over the last 12 years is that for us to really surrender into the, the, the natural animal instinct of the body, to be playful and explorative, we need to feel safe. The body doesn't open to pleasure. It has all the different hormone re- responses, the adrenaline, cortisol, all the different. Ho- if we're not feeling safe, the body will go into various forms of armor, armoring and restriction. And so I guess part of my journey has been if I want to feel bliss and ecstasy and pleasure, I need to feel safe. But no one else can purely create that safety for me. I have to create that safety inside so that I open to my own sexual pleasure. And so hence, in the work that I've witnessed with others, it's the same. It's the same process. It's like if we want to open to our sexual nature and sexual freedom and sexual play, there needs to be a sense of, can I feel safe inside myself? Sure. Yeah. So it brings pleasure, I guess, <laughs> bliss and ecstasy. <laughs> I feel we need to, to expand on that more because you mentioned earlier about how happiness for you is not the ultimate achievement. And I wanted to ask you what is, if there is anything at all, but then also for you to expand more about the sexual experience, the sexual energy that you have been referring to as well. Yeah, I think it's good. Like you say, it's good to say about the happiness. Um I had a friend say to me when I was I was having a really sad moment and she was like, well, where where did it say that we're meant to be happy? <sighs> you know, where in the manual did it say that we're meant to be happy? And it was suddenly in that moment I sort of dropped some pressure of 
actually it's right I don't actually have to be happy right now I can also be sad I can also be disappointed I can also be elated I can also be passionate I can there's this sometimes we put a lot of pressure on we have to be happy and that's not to say that it isn't a wonderful emotion to feel and a wonderful experience but when it becomes a pressure that we strive for something and we actually miss the ebb and flow of our reality which is sometimes I'm sad we make a lot of other feelings wrong. And so there's a sense that it's like, in that sense, the ultimate goal is, can I just be with what, what, what unfolds? And so then, I guess for me, what's my ultimate goal? Actually, the word that comes to mind, which is quite unusual in a sense, because I'm, I'm not really religious, but, um, and I don't mean this in a religious sense, is a sense of, uh, communion to feel the relationship with the physical body that I am which is I see as the earth and the consciousness though the energy whatever we might want to call that the consciousness that animates the earth I often see that they're making it's like they're making love together it's like a dialogue between the elements of the earth and this unknown sort of mysterious energetic quality and that they're making love together and I want to fully experience that surrender and in the moments where I fully experience that and really feel that I feel incredibly ecstatic incredibly blissful and incredibly um, unified in a, in a way that I don't think I'd ever really describe. Like I feel whole and complete. And there's a kind of ecstatic nature to it that's often quite quiet in its nature. And so I guess for me, that's what I'm aiming for in my personal life and also in the world of teaching couples tantra and esoteric practices, but also from a scientific basis, how to create inner communion, inner union, the inner embrace of energy and matter, and to flow with that dance together. And is it different for everyone, Kalindi, this type of feeling that people will have in terms of bliss and ecstasy, or is it different as the same how does it if you talk about the scientific elements because obviously you've got different hormones going on and being released at these moments so do we all feel it to the same extent or do we have differences there too I mean I, I, I guess on some level it's like everybody's going to describe their experiences differently so there's always going to be the sense that and again there's a uniqueness we're all very different and unique so the way that we might articulate or share will be always be different. And I, and of course, so there's that mystery. Is it the same? Is it not? Or is it just the way we describe it? So on that level, I don't know. Um, but from a physical level, each of us have gone on a physical journey with our body and we're all going to have different relationships with different parts of our body. So I work with the pelvis a lot for with women around their connection with their sexual energy. Some people feel very sensory connected. They can feel sensation and there's a lot moving and some women feel numb. They can't feel the sensation. So depending on our relationship with our, our somatic relationship with our body and our nervous system and the responses of our body will define and change the experience it's like how do we love do we really love being in in our breasts or in our belly or in our thighs or in our chest you know whatever it is or, or are we in a resistance to it because we don't like the way it looks or we don't connect with it or there's been a trauma there or someone's teased us in our childhood and we've got a negative relationship with it or we do we fully inhabit our body 
And so, yes, that will change people's experience of communion on a physical and energetic level because the body will receive it differently. It is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I feel I feel that we're we're literally t- sort of touching the the tip of this in in terms of what the the scope of just how powerful embracing, as you say, our inner union and having that understanding of our inside more and and that inner world that we have there. And a lot of people ignore. Uh, I don't know how. I don't know if that's true. Do people ignore this? Is or is it a case that everyone's in touch with their inner self? I guess everybody is actually on such a varying degrees because we all, when we sit on our own, you know, we know what our inner voices are saying, even if we're trying to ignore them. We we do have, or everybody has an inner relationship. It's those quiet moments where no one else is around and nothing else is distracting us. It's just whether whether we have a positive one or a rejection of self or all the complicated layers, it just depends. So I do feel everybody has that and everybody has the capacity. But I think that a lot of people don't attend to it. So it's like a garden that can grow wild and unruly. And, you know, so we go in it and we go, I'm not quite, can't see any of think because it's so overgrown and it's... um, Whereas there was beauty in there, but you can't see it all because it's all, all delicate, beautiful flowers and different things are covered over by maybe some, you know, things that inhibit. So it's like other things become louder and bigger because we've let them let them grow wild, basically. So it just depends on people's a, 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 a level of self-attending. I love the the garden metaphor. It it reminds me of the secret garden, especially as you mentioned earlier that you, that you are you know a keeper of, or you kept secrets for people. And and I would imagine that working with couples, you are privy to very personal secrets that people are holding here. So, what is it about sort of keeping these secrets as, as part of your work that is enjoyable, or 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 is, or is also a responsibility? There's definitely a huge responsibility to look after the tenderness of that moment and their story and what what that feeling is. And actually to also, there's something incredibly exquisite and beautiful when someone turns, for example, to face something they deem shameful, a story or a belief or being shamed by something in, by others or where they turn towards it. And obviously shame, what shame fears the most is the light of exposure being seen. But actually that's the remedy for shame is to be seen in a held, supportive, loving way, um, non-judgmental way. That, sh- that when someone turns towards it, it's almost like, the reclamation, the power of the relief, the energy it takes to hold that in the body. It's the relief that I witness people feel and the sense of connection that comes because they've let go of something they've, that they've been holding so tightly and they realise it's not actually as big as what the holding it tight has held in their body. And so for me, there's, and it's very humbling. I feel very humbled in my work, watching the courageousness of people facing the deep, uncomfortable parts of self. And I guess that that's what I've done in my own life is turn and face all the uncomfortable turning points of my life or challenges or everything and I respect that a lot in myself and I respect that in others so that's the mirror I guess. And what does focus on why mean to you Kalindi? What does the purpose piece transpire as? It's a really good one actually and and it was actually one of the reasons why I was really drawn to this connection because when I sit with with people and I always say, so what's your ethos? 
which is in a way is your why. What's your ethos for life? What are you trying to create underneath the story in your relationship? What are you trying to create? So it's like um, a couple sitting and reflecting, okay, so what is it we want to experience? What are we wanting to co-create? What is the why? Why are we together? Not just because we just are. It's like, what do we want to be and feel? And like the question of why, why do you have sex? What is it? What's, what's the why? Because actually, once you know what you're trying to experience, um, you can then take the steps towards what it is that you want to experience. So for me, it's been a really, really helpful, almost like a GPS guidance in my life to ask, so why, why am I here? And what is it I want to, to make happen? And so for me, the why is, well, I, I, my ethos is I, I want to live in a world where people are connecting in such a depth of integrity and connection and love and inspiration and they lift each other and support each other to be the best potential in a co-creation of life with nature and with the world around us and to actually experience a sense of a sense of deep integral joy in being it human beings in this experience and to feel the pleasure of what a gift actually this experience can be and to play and laugh and celebrate each other. So I guess that's my ethos. I That's why I want to be here and that's why I do what I do, to hopefully create moments of that deep connection and inner freedom, yeah, for myself as much as for everybody else. And that's what I, I love, Kalindi, is that you're so involved in the practice that it's part of just who you are and why you do what you do. It, it's it's so evident that it's it's intertwined. And as you said earlier, it's about you know the physical body. You you feel as though it's the earth and and that energy, the energetic energy of, of consciousness is animating. And I love that expression that you use there to. To, to that dialogue of expression of understanding who you are as, at a fundamental core level and being able to deploy that into a way that makes sense to you but also makes incredible sense to others is is a gift absolutely it's, it's beautiful and to use your words you know it is incredibly exquisite and beautiful i love that you know it really the way that you've described your work has sort of stepped set you aside from anyone else I've never had anyone describe their work as being incredibly exquisite and beautiful in terms of being a coach you know you know they might if they if it was from an aesthetics point of view if they're creating art or sculpture or something like that but what you're doing is you, from my perspective here is that you are choosing to see relationships as an art form and I love that yeah I love that I agree I and and also that we are an art form, you know, and, and any scientific, scientist or someone who investigates the body, we are absolutely creative in fascination. And that then, and also people who work with the mind, we are fascinating, the emotions, all of it, put it all together. And we are a, a creation of exquisite art, artistry of nature. So. Yeah. And I don't yeah, I want us to celebrate that more. And it seems so relevant that behind you, for those who can't see this, I just wanted to, you to describe to me the art form that you're sitting in front of as well. So, yes, beautiful. On, on, on the wall behind me is it's a, quite a large wooden door that's got a carving. Yeah, it's got a carving of Buddha's face and my partner was uh, walking along in Thailand and 
he noticed something at the corner of his eye in this woodworker's shop. And he's like, what's that? And he managed to get all the parts of it together. And it creates this beautiful temple door. We believe it to be a beautiful wooden carved Buddha door that was on a temple. And actually, it's slightly burnt. So we wonder if that its story, we've often sometimes led in bed and just looked at it and gone, I wonder what's the story of this door? You know, how did it get burnt? Did the temple burn down completely? What's its story? So it's got this beauty, but it's also got its scars and it's got its journey that it's been on. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. It's very beautiful. Oh, it's a perfect description of, of you know, what you've been sharing today of how, you know, we, we come with all these different facets. And, and yes, there are scars, there are elements of us that are perceived as not perfect, but we are, as you say, a beautiful art form. And it's been an incredible journey. And anybody who would like to understand more about their sexual experience how to how to bring that sexual energy into relationships how would they get in contact with you kalindi so i have a website which is my name kalindijordan.com and that's got all the information of all the things that um i offer which is varying from one-to-one sessions to retreats uh, and retreats for couples and yeah there's lots of different offerings or lots of different ways to to connect with me Fabulous. Well, they'll all go. Well, it will go in the show notes. Are you on social media at all or is it just the website? I do. I've got an Instagram, which again is my name and the same with Facebook. Yeah, I've stopped there because there's so many we can be on. It was a bit much. (laughs) No, that's great. So if anyone's on Instagram or Facebook, they'll look you out. Kalindi, I have been taken into an incredible world and I don't want this episode to stop. It's been so interesting to understand and I I wouldn't even talk about pleasure in the detail that I want to so there's going to be further conversations going on for sure but (laughs) thank you so much for sharing for sharing this incredible depth of understanding more about who we are as humans and it really is a fascinating as you say a fascinating topic to understand our uniqueness in in a different way so thank you for bringing that to us how would you like to close out the episode for us today I guess inviting each of us to stay in self-fascination and to find out what does attending to your inner landscape mean and What might have got in the way of your own pleasure, meaning your own self-love, receiving your self-love, receiving love, receiving physical pleasure, receiving emotional pleasure? What's maybe got in the way? It's the first step of attending. And what does it need for it to move so that you can reclaim what's rightfully yours? to be in yourself, deep self-worth and self-love. Thank you for listening to Focus on Why with me, Amy Rowlandson. To show your appreciation and to help other listeners understand what value you have received from tuning in today, please leave me an Apple podcast five-star review. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the inspiring, uplifting and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.